And we also have been living with type 1 diabetes for a number of years. And today we're going to focus in on a really important topic. Although the title is kind of cutesy, keep your heart pumping and kidneys kicking, um, it's a serious topic and um, it's something that affects every type of diabetic, type mm -hmm. 1, type 2. And we're going to give you a lot of really good information. And, and we got some housekeeping things for my partner here to tell you. Yeah, so we're using a service where you can be watching us through all kinds of different platforms now. Facebook, LinkedIn, I think a few others. TikTok. Um, so uh, if you're watching, feel free to enter comments on whatever your platform you're watching. And those can come to us as questions also. So if you have questions, write them down anytime. Um, those will be funneled to us uh, that we can review at the end of the presentation to actually go through and answer. So it's pretty cool. And then, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pull up the slides, but I think this is, you know, such an important topic because, you know, anybody that knows anything about diabetes, as soon as you say, like, diabetes, it's like, oh, you're going to go blind, you're going to lose your foot, your kidneys are going to fail. There's a lot of doom and gloom and misinformation about it. So this is really about how to, you know, flip the script on that and how to stay healthy um, motivated, active with diabetes, and guess what? If you do that, you know, you, you can avoid these complications. I and think a lot of people just think it's gonna happen. Yeah, and live longer than some of your non-diabetic counterparts. Yeah, those losers. What, <laughs> <laughs> if you pay attention to your health, because so much of this relates to blood pressure, uh, cholesterol levels, keeping your weight as best you can. Uh, so there's a lot of healthy living things that really are important to the health of your your heart and your kidneys. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna go through the heart first mm -hmm. and keep pay attention to the overlap of things that you can do to protect your heart and your kidneys because they are tied together physiologically, believe it or not, even though your heart's up here, your kidneys are <laughs> back here, oh sorry. And um, so we're gonna go through what, what you see on the screen, what, what is heart disease, what's the relation with diabetes, and what puts you at risk and what you can do about it. Okay. Now this, whoops, okay, a little slow changer here. This is a picture of the heart. Mm -hmm. And I, you can see those arrows. Um, and Jeremy is closer to his internal medicine training than I am, but I put the large arteries on there. And what are these arteries for? To bring blood to your heart, all the muscles of your heart, which I'll show you in a second. And like you talk about the left anterior descending, the LAD, now, why do they call that the Widowmaker? Yeah, I mean, that's the one that, you know, if that artery gets blocked, it, since it provides a lot of blood and oxygen to a major part of the heart, if that artery gets blocked, that, that can be really fatal. Yeah, and this is a picture uh, of an artery on the bottom. You can see where that big blue arrow is. That part of the opening is clogged off by plaque. Years of high cholesterol, especially LDL, uh, and also uh, high blood pressure can actually cause hardening of the arteries. And once that uh, opening gets so small, you prevent blood from going where it's supposed to go. Yeah, I think, you know, explaining to people actually what a heart attack is. So, you know, we always think, like you said, that we, we think about the heart pumping blood to the rest of the body, but it also has to pump blood to itself. You know, it's a big muscle. And it's just those arteries that you showed that, that, that perfuse the heart with blood. And again, if one of those becomes blocked, you become, you know, in a lot of trouble. So a heart attack is when you have one of these, what we call plaques in the arteries, that there's cholesterol there. Um, it gets kind of, you know, the, the, the artery gets narrowed but it can actually rupture. And when it ruptures, it completely and acutely clogs all the blood you know, downstream from wherever that happens, and that can lead to the heart attack, where all of a sudden there's chest pain because your heart is not getting enough blood and the heart tissue actually starts dying. And I've heard the phrase stroke attack, which is which kind of a good phrase because when the arteries going to the brain occlude, you don't get blood to the brain, you have a, you have a stroke, and then you, you're left with a deficit you know, depending on what, what part of your brain is affected. So the, the, the key here is prevention. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't want to get to the point where you need a cardiac bypass or a stent. Well, and, and thank God we have those interventions, but we'd like to avoid those altogether for sure. Now, this slide is just to show you, uh, to emphasize a little bit what Jeremy was saying, that the heart is really a muscular organ. Think about this, someone lives to average 70, 80, 90 years of age. That heart is pumping on average, you know, 60 to 100 times a minute for 80 years. 
Yeah, and, impressive. And the reason I put this slide here is to let you know that one of the, the most common cardiac issues diabetics face is congestive heart failure. So maybe you can let them know. How could you explain congestive heart failure in lay terms? Yeah, congestive heart failure is when the, the, the muscle of the heart becomes weak for some reason. That could be you had a prior heart attack, maybe you have valve problems, a whole bunch of different reasons. And when the heart doesn't contract as well as it should, and blood doesn't, you know, kind of disseminate the way it should, it can cause problems. Um, the, the, I kind of think of it as the blood gets backed up a little bit. You can get fluid in your lungs, you can get fluid in your legs, um, and it can cause lots of problems. Yeah, <laughs> like death. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one thing that's, it's kind of a scary thought, but the data shows that if you have one episode of congestive heart failure, your chances of having another and another, and every time you have an episode of congestive heart failure, um, your muscles lose contractility ability, mm -hmm. and your, uh, your five-year mortality, that's us doctor talk, goes down, so, um, or goes up. Um, so anyway. Well, I was just thinking as we're talking, like, you're talking about how strong the heart is, it's a big muscle, like giraffes, I don't know why I know this, they have really big hearts because they gotta push blood all the way up their long neck to their brain. And when they sleep, they have to sleep with their head up because if they apparently lay their head down, it would actually explode because I'm serious. This is a giraffe heart fact. Were you on a safari or something? <laughs> yeah, actually, I think I was, and I, I never forgot that about a, a giraffe heart. They got long legs, too. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> they have very unique knee, knees. Yeah. You know, orthopods study them because, you know, they got to hold up. We'll do a different talk on giraffe, <laughs> uh, like anatomy. So, basically, um, we need to pay attention to it, and we're going to get into some things that you need to know as well. So these, this is a long laundry list of risk factors for heart disease, and right at the top is family history. You know it's always our parents' fault. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, heart disease goes up with age, and I think one of the things that Jeremy spends most of his research time with is looking at the causes of heart disease in type 1 diabetes. You want to give a quick one-liner on your insulin resistance thing? Because that's important. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, you know, us type 1s, we're at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And because of that, we need to be paying attention to all these different things. Like, as practitioners, we think about when we see somebody with type 2 diabetes, we immediately think about blood pressure, cholesterol, weight. But we need to be thinking about those same things when in type 1 diabetes and putting just as much attention into it because us type 1s are at high risk of cardiovascular disease too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's important because at least in the doctor's world, we always talk about heart disease and type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. but it's the number one cause of passing away of everybody on this planet, but also both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, the tendency to form clots, that's important too, and that's why we're going to get to some of the suggestions about taking a baby aspirin when you get to a certain age. And clots are not good because uh, they, they travel down the bloodstream and these arteries become narrower and narrower physiologically. They come into arterioles, you know, as they get to the extremities and then you get to a point where they can block blood from going downstream. And then you end up with problems right there. High blood pressure, um, you know what, how important this is? Your blood, the blood pressure uh, goes to every organ in your body and especially your heart and your kidney. And it, if your blood pressure is too high over the years, it just puts tremendous pressure on your heart muscles and your kidney functioning ability. And it's, it's probably the num a number one cause of heart failure and kidney failure, more than glucose control actually. Yeah, and that's the point I wanted to highlight that, you know, a lot of people can, uh, type 1s, type 2s say, I don't have to worry about this, my A1C is under control, like I'm not going to have problems with, you know, uh, heart attack, strokes, whatever. Blood pressure and cholesterol are much more important when it comes to heart health than actually blood sugars. It doesn't mean forget about your blood sugars. Blood sugar control is extremely important, but blood sugar control is more important for what we call microvascular complications, your eyes, your feet, your kidneys. But when it comes to your heart, yeah, yeah. it's really about blood pressure and cholesterol, so please don't ignore it. Put as much tension to that as you do your blood sugars. And we're going to get to it later, but I'm just going to say it now. Everybody should have their own blood pressure cuff with diabetes, just like you'd have your own glucose meter or your CGM device. Um, abnormal cholesterol levels, that's, we don't look at total very much because it's, it's kind of misleading, but we have the LDL, the HDL, and the triglycerides, and we're going to get into the details of that. And then, of course, being overweight, we know type 2s have a tough time. 
uh, because being overweight, especially what we, we've talked about, the central adiposity, it's tough to lose. Mm -hmm. So anything you could do to reduce your weight, excess weight is good. Take your time. Lots of good stuff on our website about yeah. dietary stuff. And I was just going to say again, the, the majority of type ones now we know struggle with being overweight or obese. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So again, we're finding there's a lot more similarities than differences when it comes to this, especially like heart and kidney health. Yeah, exercise and smoking. I mean, for the, some of you smokers out there, we realize it's a tough addiction. And we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna vilify anybody that's smoking, but you know, obviously you know it, it's just not good for your health. Mm -hmm. And we, we can talk about that all day. Um, okay. Now, I, once again, I don't want to get too cutesy about this, but it is kind of a good way to remember yeah. some of the risk factors. The A, B, C, D, E. E is smoking. We'll get that out of the way. So let's eliminate smoking. It's like kind of a stretch. It should be S, but it's just eliminate smoking. So yeah, you, you gotta you gotta yeah. have it there. Okay. <laughs> you gotta have it. It could be a long no, way to get to the S and the alpha. It is cutesy, but it's a really good way to remember this. You know, you're going to go through what each one rem like stands for, but A, B, C, D. E. Yeah. Um, and if you know those things, you really can keep your heart and kidneys healthy and safe. Well, E could be Edelman. Yeah. You know, that's the good thing. Okay. Ed Edelman shouldn't smoke. Okay. Yeah. What's the most up-to-date recommendations for aspirin, Jeremy? And why is it good? I got the recommendations on the next slide. Yeah. Well, you can put up the recommendations. But basically, uh, aspirin, we know what that is. You know, in higher doses, we use it for headaches, etc. But at this low doses, it can actually help avoid blood clots, make your, your blood a little bit thinner, if you will, um, to ultimately help avoid heart attacks and strokes. And you have the recommendations here. Um, really, we say people over 50 years with diabetes um, should be on a baby aspirin. Yeah, 81 milligrams, you know, you can get it at Costco, inexpensive. And the other thing is, if you have cardiac conditions already, no matter what age, you might want to check with your cardiologist or your doctor that, um, recommendations earlier. Now, I'm not going to read you this cartoon. It's a dumb, it's a dumb cartoon, so it's good that you can't see it. <laughs> so that, that's an important point. It's like a baby blood thinner. Yeah, very easy to take. And then, you know, on this side here, you said men and women over 50 years old with diabetes who have increased risk of heart disease. Why don't you just say over 50 with diabetes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because they have increased risk of heart disease. You know, the, the recommendation for aspirin, uh, it, it changes depending on which organization makes their recommendation. But um, the, the recommendation for aspirin came, do you remember the, uh, the nurse, the, I forgot the name of the exact study, the, the, the National Nurse Study, where they, they questioned hundreds of thousands of nurses and they asked them if they took aspirin or not. And it, the ones that took aspirin had clearly a large reduction in heart attacks and strokes. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But remember that aspirin is uh, not 100% safe. Uh, you can't be on any other blood thinners. And there are some rare conditions where you should not be taking aspirin. Mm -hmm. But for most people, it's super safe. Yeah. You can go to Costco and get like a jug of it and have like a year supply, like, you know, just kind of there for you to take. Okay. Well, well, A is also for A1C. I'm, we're not going to spend too much time in this. You know, everyone's always trying to get their A1C at goal, as well as their time and range. Um, and, you know, this says talk to your healthcare provider about your goal. Not everybody needs to be less than seven. Um, and uh, I, I talked to a patient this morning. She was beating herself up because she's usually less than seven, and she was 7.1. <laughs> I'm going, hey, I said, Lena, your <laughs> 7.1 is pretty darn res respectable. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're Let's say in your 85, 90, and you have hypoglycemia unawareness, um, and you know less than 7.5 or less than 8 is still in a safe range. Mm -hmm. So A for baby aspirin, also A1C, just meaning get your blood sugars under control as best as you can. Talk to your health provider. Uh, I love the way you, you summarize, uh, recap. Mm -hmm. Okay, B, blood pressure. We've already talked about the importance of it. Let's give you a little more detail. Um, you can't really see this on the slide, but it talks about these are the formal levels of blood pressure. And we're gonna tell you in a second that um, the blood pressure for most people with diabetes. Now, these recommendations have changed through the years too. Oh, yeah. Right now, like the American Heart Association says less than 140 over 90. I think that's too high. Um, you know what, there is there is a thing as too low a blood pressure. So um, I wrote here less than 130 over 80 
if you told me you were one, less than 130 over 85, I'd be happy with that. And some people are 120 over 80. So this is what I say. If, if you look at the blood pressure for your uh, young adult life and you're not on blood pressure pills, let's, let's say it was always 120 over 80. And then someone says to you, oh, you need to be on a ACE inhibitor, which is a class of blood pressure pills we're gonna talk about. If, you're, if your blood pressure is still 120 over 80 and there's no microalbumin in the urine, we'll talk about that too, I don't recommend blood pressure lowering agents. But if someone's 125 over 85 and they used to be 120 over 80 their whole life, to me, that's elevated. And I wouldn't hesitate to take anything to look, keep your blood pressure down. One more thing. If your blood pressure gets too low, that's not good for the kidneys. And, and it could also be not good for the heart. And how do you tell? Well, a lot of the easy way to tell is if, if you get dizzy when you go from a sitting to a standing or a laying to a standing position, mm -hmm. you're, you get lightheaded, your blood pressure may be too low. And if you lose a bunch of weight on purpose and you, that happens to you and you're already on blood pressure pills, you might need an adjustment. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about the, the medications next. But again, these are relatively easy to take typically once a day, like minimal side effects. Um, and I find that a lot of times people are very resistant to taking blood pressure medications. I think, um, I don't know, they think that, oh, I can do better, I can change my diet, like whatever. Um, it, it's very hard to reduce um, uh, blood pressure with diet. It doesn't mean don't try, but I, I find that people, I think, need to be a little bit more willing to take blood pressure medications because they're so important. Yeah, I wrote down some dietary measures, but I think, uh, not a, and not everyone is salt sensitive, by the way. You can't just say, okay, let's eliminate the salt. G one thing I showed on the previous slide was a picture of someone measuring their own blood pressure. Yeah, do you have your own blood pressure cuff? I do, I think yeah. it's yours, I is, stole it. <laughs> <laughs> is it a wrist one or an arm one? I have an arm one, yeah. Yeah, you know what? You really need to get a good uh, blood pressure cuff. If you have big arms like, my, like me and Jeremy, you need to make sure the cuff size is big enough. Seriously, and uh, you have to make sure it's done right. You have to read the instructions. Yeah, you know, need your, it has to be at the level of the heart. And blood pressure changes like airline prices and rent a car prices. So multiple measurements are important, and it's way more important than when you go to the doctor's office. And then, you say low salt diet. Do you know what the number one source of salt in people's diet is? IPA. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually bread. Um, that bread has a lot of salt in it. So like, there's things that, like, like that that people don't think about. Certainly like not adding salt to things is one thing, but bread actually is our number one source of, source of salt. Those, right those everything bagels? Yeah. <laughs> well, they have tons of good stuff on there. Well, talk about the medications, Jeremy, because um, why are ACEs and ARBs recommended for people with diabetes? Yeah, so first we have a, a bunch of different classes of medications for blood pressure. Um, but it's been studied in people with diabetes, especially people with diabetes with any kind of hint of, of problems with their kidneys, that these two classes of medication are the best. They, they work to lower blood pressure, um, they help to, to you know, protect the kidneys to keep them healthy, and then also certainly if you have heart failure or other things that they, they're helpful there. So they just have the most kind of benefits to them. They're well tolerated, easy to take. These have been around for a long time, so they're also cheap. Yeah. So there's lots of reasons why we use these. Yeah, the, the ACE inhibitors are like, I take Monopril. There's also Fosinopril, there's Ramapril. They all ending in yeah. Pril. Analapril, Lisinopril, yeah. Yeah, and then the ARBs are very similar. They work in a similar manner as like low sartan. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there's a zillion of them. And you know, I, what I like about what we're doing today on this live is that we're not talking about glucose the whole time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about things yeah, I'm that I'm tired are, of talking about glucose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This stuff is so important, and the more we talk about it, the more I realize it is. So, The one thing I'll say is that one of the side effects of the ACE inhibitors is that people can get a little cough um, that can be nagging, and that's one reason why we might switch to them to an ARB or whatever. But you don't necessarily have to like remember these terms. I, I know it becomes alphabet soup. Um, your provider will know, you know, the blood pressure medication you should be on. Um, and we kind of listed some of them. And these, again, are generic and, and very easy to come by. Yeah, and if these, you know, the main purpose is to get your blood pressure down. There's probably like five other classes of them. Yeah. You want to find the one that you don't have any side effects to, low dose as possible to keep your blood pressure where you want it. Okay, C is cholesterol. Um, Okay, the way to remember this, your LDL is the one that 
people talk about all the time that really causes damage to your heart. So L for lousy. H is the HDL, and that's the high density. That's the heart, that's the type of cholesterol that protects you, mm -hmm. and that's why we call it high or healthy. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's important to remember. Like you know, when we talked initially about that, you showed that picture of the actual plaques, uh, cholesterol plaques in the arteries of the coronary arteries. It is that LDL that really gets into the the arteries and kind of like extends that wall, um, and that's the one that causes problems. And the HDL we think of as kind of a a garbage truck in the in the body that can go and actually take cholesterol out of the bloodstream and bring it back to the liver. So, um, just a little bit of background. Did they have garbage trucks in that safari? No, too? I'm just sad <laughs> you didn't have a garbage I truck like, next to it. I like that. That's yeah. a good thought. Triglycerides are another form of fat. This is the form of fat that you have to fast for when you get your cholesterol checked. Now, I'll just say one little thing here that I mentioned earlier. When you look at the total cholesterol on your sheet. It's made up of these three. So let's say you're really healthy, exercise, and you have a very high HDL. That's gonna make your total higher. Mm -hmm. And for doctors that don't know what they're doing, if the total goes over 200, they say, oh, you need, you need uh, cholesterol meds. So you have to look at these three individually, mm -hmm. and that's key. And I think this next slide talks about the goals. Um, and just real briefly, every person with diabetes should be less than 100 when we're looking at the LDL. And if you've had any heart problems already, or let's say multiple risk factors for heart disease, then everyone wants you to get below 70. And uh, Jeremy and I work with some very famous lipidologists like Joe Woodstam uh -huh. and Dan Steinberg, may he rest in peace. And they spent their whole lives studying LDL and their bottom line is the lower the better. Yeah. And that's something that's definitively been proven now, that the lower your LDL gets, you know, no matter how you get it there, drugs otherwise, um, the lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. And I think these goals are important to have kind of this framework, but we're actually kind of moving slightly away from the, the, the number itself to defining risk. And I think you have on the next slide that we're now, to make it a little bit simple, anybody who's 40 or over who has diabetes should be on a, a lipid lowering drug. Uh, regardless of your LDL level, because we know that people are at you know such high risk, and you know, sorry, I was going to say is that you know just as people, I said people are resistant to taking blood pressure medication, people are particularly resistant to taking cholesterol medication. Well, statins. Statins. Don't read the internet. Yeah. I even have that here. Those crazy folks on the internet. So you know, I'll see a patient and their LDL is I don't know 110, and they say you know give me you know, three months, I'll get it down. I'm just gonna eat grass, you know, for three months or like whatever it is. <laughs> what and is? it's just, it's really, it's really hard <laughs> to get your LDL down with, with diet. Um, and, you know, so even if you're, you know, a saint and eating all the right things, you can get it down a little bit. But these statins can easily reduce it 30, 40, sometimes 50%. And that's really a lot of the times the oomph you need um, to get your, your cholesterol down. Yeah, you know what? I, I think if you talk to any healthcare professional, the one drug that they get the most pushback on is statins. So the side effects of statins, you know, they're very well tolerated. Like any other drug, you want to start with a good statin. There's a whole bunch now. Mm -hmm. You start with a super low dose. You measure again in three months and you find the dose that uh, gets your LDL to your goal. And the main side effect, as far as I know, is some people develop muscle aches. Mm -hmm. And that can happen. But please make sure it doesn't happen with your first pill that you swallow from the pharmacy because I've had patients tell me it's about right here in their esophagus whoops <laughs> they call me I got muscle aches you know and uh, so it has to be it is a real thing it is definitely but I will say sometimes it can be dependent on the actual specific statin you're taking so if it does happen you can try either lowering the dose sometimes you can take it even every other day you can change the statin and if you've gone through all the statins and none of them work this is where you have that there's other medications now um, that you can you can try and especially these PCSK9 inhibitors um, that are like an injection you take every other week um, they're very very efficacious we're using them more and more so if you've had problems with statins and kind of just felt like well my cholesterol is what it is now like you need to revisit this and either try a statin or some of these other medications because there's a lot of options now yeah there's an older one called Zedia it's not the most potent but there's no side effects and also uh, there's a new one out there called Nexlatol. It's a completely different mechanism of action 
And all of these medications, the newer ones are the more expensive ones, and usually the indication is they have failed statin therapy, either you're on a statin, the maximum dose, and your LDL is not at your goal, or you develop side effects. Mm -hmm. And your doctor probably will have to fill out what we call a prior authorization, um, but it's worthwhile. Yeah. And the good news is once you get this squared away, you're kind of good. Mm -hmm. You know, you get on your, your statin or your PCSK9, whatever, and you kind of leave it alone. Um, and again, like I say, we always like pour over the blood sugars and should we do this, should we do that? Just make sure you've dedicated some time to addressing this and then get your cholesterol locked down and then you kind of don't have to think about it. Yeah, the most common cause of passing away uh, for people with diabetes is heart disease. So don't forget that. And you know, the other thing I'm gonna mention when uh, Jeremy and I are gonna do a podcast on the diabetes warranty program, and it's gonna cover some of this information, but if you think about it, high blood pressure, not the kind that gives you nosebleeds, but just high, and also problems with cholesterol, they do not cause any symptoms. That's why people can go 10, 20, 30 years of high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, and just end up crumping with a heart attack, stroke, et cetera, kidney failure. So remember, these conditions are asymptomatic. Um, okay, we're, I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah, we got, I like the little recap here. Aspirin, A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol. Okay, I'm up, I'm up to speed. <laughs> Diabetes drugs. Okay, well, that, set that up. What do you mean by that? Diabetes drugs, um, you know, it, in the olden days, in fact, you saw the three little blocks that say ABC, like kindergarten. There's no there D. There wasn't a D. Because there, it wasn't until just the last couple of years that we realized a lot of these drugs we use for diabetes actually improve the health of the heart and prevent heart problems. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new area. In Independent of the, their blood sugar effects, that these have specific effects on helping the kidneys and the heart, and we say this all the time, that now we're using some of these medications, even in people that don't have diabetes, uh, because of their specific effects on the heart and kidneys. Yeah, now here's the, here's the alphabet soup, but mm -hmm. GLP-1 receptor agonist. You see how clearly I say that? Mm -hmm. you know, GLP-1. <laughs> <laughs> so you're all seeing commercials. I guess Victoza was one of the older ones daily, but you see probably a lot of commercials with Ozembic. How's and, the song go? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and then there's Trulicity. These are once weekly. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're impressive at bringing the glucose down. Um, they also reduce weight, which is really important for people. And these drugs are approved for type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And very importantly, you know, they have been shown and proven by large studies called cardiovascular outcome trials to reduce heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you talk about the SGLT2 inhibitors. Yeah, please. so you know, one of the, so the GLP ones, I think you said they're injections, and um, these SGLT2 inhibitors are actually once a day pills. Um, and the way that they work is they actually make you pee out a little sugar. So people's blood sugars come down, they lose some weight, and the data in terms of preventing heart failure, strokes, um, and preserving kidney function has just been overwhelming. And so these are the drugs that I mentioned that in anybody with kidney problems now we're using diabetes or not, anybody with heart failure we're using diabetes or not. So I actually believe that if you have type 2 diabetes, you should, like period, you should be on these two drugs. But especially if you have any heart or kidney issues, you absolutely need to be on these medications. So a lot of these have been around for a long time now. So again, like, you know, there's a lot of new data, but these aren't like something that just came out yesterday that we're waiting to see how yeah. they work. We know a lot about these drugs. We know about their side effects or whatever. So if you're not on these medications, you definitely should ask. Yeah, I, I should let, emphasize something that Jeremy just said. The American Diabetes Association gives out guidelines for doctors. And they say that um, you should use one of these two medications if there's presence of heart disease or kidney disease already, irregardless of the A1C. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote a, a, a question for doctors, a trick question. I, I described a patient with an A1C of 6.9, but I think she had a heart attack and she, she was on a bunch of diabetes meds, but she wasn't on one of these. And I said, what would you do next? And one of them was do nothing, A1C is good. The other one was add SGLT2 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. That was the right answer. So it's important that you know that as a person living with diabetes. And we know that there's a big uh, issue with access. So um, there are ways to get these medications and we're not gonna spend too much time now, but we, we're gonna have a new 
uh, area on our website uh, in October of this year, 2022, about access. Cool. So we know that can be frustrating for a lot of people because we get feedback that we talk about all these great drugs, but they can't get it. Did you know that irregardless is not a word? It's just regardless. So it's like I got draft facts and little like grammatical no, facts. The, the garbage all, truck too. Yeah, garbage truck. That's all I'm good for. So E is for Edelman eliminate smoking. Okay, let's let's move on. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have a thing about weight control because uh, I did mention it earlier. Weight control is important for your heart. It takes pr takes pressure off your heart in many ways. Also your joints. Uh, and I already mentioned Trulicity, Ozembic, and then the newest uh, drug on the market, Monjaro. Uh, who that. All three of these can lead to significant weight loss. Mm -hmm. Are they approved for type ones that are heavy? No. So unfortunately, none of these medications, the GLP ones or SGLT twos, are approved for for type ones. But the Manjaro, we haven't talked about a lot because as of now, it doesn't have the cardiovascular and kidney, you know, benefits that these other drugs do. We think it will. It just hasn't been fully studied yet. But the weight loss of of Manjaro, which again. I prescribed for the first time a, a week or so ago. It's just, it's just that brand new. The weight loss with that drug is just phenomenal. People how, losing 40, 50 pounds, that kind of stuff. How do you pronounce it? I say Manjaro, but like... Come on. Bon Manjaro. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Watch a dose of Dr. Mm -hmm. E and P uh, where we focus in on this medication. Um, okay, good nutrition. We're not gonna spend too much time on that, although it's extremely important. And of course, physical activity. Okay. You know, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that, like, just real quick on these. A lot of times people uh, will say, well, how much physical activity, um, especially people in, like, the, the pre-diabetic world, like, whatever. The official recommendations from the American Diabetes Association are 150 minutes a week. So that works out to about 30 minutes a day, five days a week of something sustained. I think a lot of times exercise is overwhelming to people. I don't, I'm not comfortable going to a gym. I, I don't know how to get on a treadmill, whatever. Something sustained is something that works in your, uh, your life. So that can be just you know, walking, that can be riding a bike at, at home, can be going upstairs. It doesn't have to be um, such a you know, leap to you know, joining a gym and changing my yeah. life. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy puts on spandex, he goes to the gym. You don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, a good friend of mine, Daryl Tonema, who's a Native American diabetes specialist. He, he had a great talk and he had a whole series of these. And I love this joke. If you're gonna, if you're gonna start cross country skiing, start with a small country. You know, I thought it was cute. All right, ready for the kidneys. Okay, why do they call the kidneys beans? And they look like beans. They look like kidney beans, exactly. <laughs> and that's why you can get them in a can. So we're gonna go through the same process talking about the kidneys. So let's start. The purpose of really the kidneys are to, if you just want to say one thing about the kidneys, they filter the blood of all the things we want to get out of the blood, toxins, uh, glucose for that matter, electrolytes. And I think even on this next slide, it goes through a little more detail. You know, first of all, they, they get rid of waste products. And that's why when your kidneys fail, you have to go on dialysis. Because if these waste products build up, unfortunately, that's not compatible with life. Um, then there's excess salt, it helps get rid of salts. If you have too much fluid in your body, it'll help get rid of that fluid by, you know, through the urine. Um, and all kinds of things with acid-base balance. And I say that because you've all heard the phrase ketoacidosis too. So it, it, the kidneys are intimately involved in many functions of the body. And uh, uh, on a lecture I gave with Dr. Santos, one of our other star faculty, that the kidney and the heart are intimately linked, even though you would not think so. And of course, there's the glomerular filtration rate, the GFR, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. That's one of the most important, one of the most important tests to measure how you're doing. Yeah, um, and that's something that people might be familiar with. They see it on their lab report, yeah, their creatinine, yeah. their GFR, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so there's the last slide of what they do for you. They do a lot of things, well, second to last. You know, they're important for keeping your blood count up. Mm -hmm. When, if you're, they make a very important hormone called erythropoietin. That is a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. And so at, when people's kidneys fail, even on an earlier stage, not dialysis level, their blood count drops and that makes them lose energy. Mm -hmm. And it gets to a certain level, then you have to take... Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. It's, it's, it's actually incredible what 
the kidneys do. We always think they filter out bad stuff. I think people would say that, but yeah, they're responsible for your blood counts, for bone health, for fluid status. Like there's just a lot of stuff that they do. And this one, this next one too, uh, bone strength, you know, uh, vitamin D. So every time we talk about an organ in our bodies, what do we say? It's amazing mm -hmm. how impressive that organ is. So the bottom line is, and, and the immune system, uh, did you know that? Immune system is weakened as kidney. That makes sense. Yeah, so I mean, the kidney really has major effects on the body. We wanna, we wanna prevent you guys from needing dialysis. Some of you are already on dialysis. We have, we're not gonna talk about the different types, but um, there's lots of good ways to treat people who eventually need, including uh, a transplantation. Okay, this is a really important slide. Um, this is what you need to know. Um, and you need to keep your own list as well. And looking at this over time is really important. So as Jeremy said, on your routine metabolic panel that everyone gets before they see the doctor, it's got a creatinine, it's got a BUN, and those are kidney function tests. BUN is really a function of uh, you know, how hydrated you are, but also your kidney function. But it's a pretty gross test. It's not, uh, it's not as specific as we like it. So the GFR is really important. And that, that number categorizes uh, what kind of uh, chronic kidney disease you have or normal kidney mm -hmm. disease. Normal's above 60. Then there's, the then there's CKD3, which is 30 to 60. And then below 30 is stage four. Stage five is, uh, is dialysis. 15. Yeah. So the GFR, like Steve said, glomerular filtration rate, is just how much volume your kidneys are able to, to filter. And you want that to number to be higher because you want your kidneys you know, filtering as much as possible. As the kidneys get damaged and these, these what we call nephrons, the tubes in the, the kidneys get damaged, that GFR starts coming down. Um, the GFR is calculated based mostly on the creatinine, um, which is another you know, measure in your blood. Um, the higher your creatinine is, the lower your GFR, so you actually want your creatinine to be low, which will make your GFR be high. If none of this makes sense to you at all, it's just, that's completely okay. Just make sure to go over these results with your, your provider. A lot of these will have a little exclamation mark if it comes up abnormal, and just ask what it means yeah. uh, when you talk to your provider. I mean, if you remember, if you remember anything, G, GR, uh, glomerular filtration rate, filtration rate, how well do your kidneys filter? and the lower the number, the worse it is, and the higher the better. And yeah. yeah. I was gonna say the positive aspect of it, the higher Yeah, you're the right, better. you're right, you're right. The higher the better. And sometimes the lab will, will just say above 60, but some labs will say 95, mm -hmm. 110. Now, and the other thing that's really important that you need to know is besides the filtering ability of a kidney, you wanna know about the structural damage of your kidney. And how do you do that? You measure this thing called the urine albumin to creatinine ratio. It's called UACR. It's also a standard measurement. So you talk to kidney doctors and they'll say, GFR is really important, talks about the filtering ability, but the UACR is more important. Yeah, so what it's really measuring is if there's protein in your urine. So people with completely healthy kidneys, uh, when, they, when they urinate, there's, there's, there's no protein that goes in the urine. However, if the kidney starts getting damaged, you can think of these, these tubes becoming a little bit leaky, if you will, and protein starts to kind of spill out into the urine, and it's a sign of, of damage to the kidneys, like Steve said. And the more damage there is, the more protein that'll show up. So this urine to albumin, microalbumin ratio um, will be calculated when you provide a urine sample, and you just want that to be less than 30. Yeah, and this is important for you to know because some doctors don't even know enough to order this. And not putting down the medical profession, but you know, you need to know mm -hmm. the EGFR and the UACR. Those are the two most important tests you and can get. And it should be done at least yearly for everybody with diabetes. Yeah, and if and you, if, if you're making changes to your, you, you know, your health, your blood pressure pills, your if your kidney function is being evaluated over time, you might get it sooner. And listen, if you have abnormal values, I. I would feel comfortable if you said, I'm, I'm gonna ask if I can see a kidney specialist. Totally. Seeing these doctors early are key, is uh -huh. key. Um, and then we, here are the other things we've already talked about. We don't really have to spend too much time. We've already talked about blood pressure control uh, and gl blood glucose control. And the thing that we should mention down here at the bottom, which is very important, is the SGLT2 inhibitors 
and a new medication called Corindia. These are two medications that were completely different. They've been proven and, and approved by the FDA to reduce the progression of people with chronic kidney disease. And uh, Farziga also did a, did a large study with people with and without diabetes. Their, their GFR was around 35. So that's chronic kidney disease for sure. And it clearly showed compared to the fake pill, the placebo, they had a much slower reduction in kidney function over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, like very much better. So, um, and same with Corindia. The only thing I wanted to point out here about blood sugar control is that this isn't binary. Like you're doing good if your A1C is less than seven and you're doing bad if it's above seven. Any improvement you make in your A1C reduces your complications, specifically with kidney disease. So if you have an A1C of 12 and you want to get it you know, down, going from 12 to 11 is very, very helpful. 11 to 10, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah, we want to ultimately try to get you to seven, um, but any improvement matters. And specifically, every reduction in A1C of about 1%, going from 12 to 11, reduces your risk of, of complications by about 30%. That's amazing so a, you know that. It's that's a big that's so deal. old data. Yeah. Well, that's, that's amazing. Giraffes, regardless, <laughs> and but, that fact. You know, and I think your, your point's well taken that damage to your kidneys uh, doesn't happen overnight, and it takes time. So it, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And don't, don't panic if your blood sugar's high for even a couple of years. You know, you, you, can, you always work from this day forward. Yeah. So, um, and the other thing about, I just go back to these medications, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, Carindia, um, if you have, what, what, if doctors told you you have chronic kidney disease and you're not on one of these medications, you need to just have a nice conversation because um, a lot of doctors don't know that. Mm -hmm. I know I'm putting down the medical profession, but um, one thing we do at TCOID, the, the, the reason why we started this organization is taking control of your diabetes that to make sure nothing's forgotten by your healthcare professionals. They have a lot to keep in their mind, and so you need to keep diabetes in your mind as well too. So the other thing is uh, very important, protect your kidneys. So I don't know if you all know this, but drugs like Advil um, and Motrin, they're, they're what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatories at the bottom. Now for most people with normal kidney function, it's not a big deal at all. You just don't want to overdose in them. But if you have kidney problems, any at all, you should try to avoid those. Uh -huh. Stick with Tylenol as much as possible. Um, and then the other one is uh, dyes, like um, when they give you radiographic dye for an MRI. And, and if you need an MRI, if it's life-threatening, they can use a lower amount of dye. They can hydrate you before and flush it out afterwards. But you need to let them know. I, you know what I have on my medical record? Hmm. I'm allergic to di radiographic dyes. Am I? No. I just want to make sure that I don't get it if I'm unconscious. Hmm. Okay. How come you got that look on your face? No, I just, okay. I didn't know that. It's very rare I learn a new thing Well, don't about look you. at my record. That's HIPAA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Well, recap. Okay. So, heart pumping and kidneys kicking. And I think the over-global message is that there's a lot of overlap. Control your blood sugars, your blood pressure, your you know, lipids. And, you know, some of these things don't have to be so onerous and so much work. I think it's just being aware of it, knowing what the risks are and kind of tackling them head on rather than this nebulous, I'm just gonna die, I have diabetes, I have, you know, I'm gonna like, my heart's gonna, you know, fail, et cetera. That's not true. Um, but the more, you know, energy you put into it, understanding your body, understanding the goals, you're gonna do really well. And even if you have complications, you already have heart disease, kidney disease, it's never too late. So educating yourself just like you're doing now, taking uh, some of the points that we've made, take them to your provider, uh, can really make a difference. And so, again, there's a lot of overlap on your heart and your kidneys. Take control of your, your diabetes, your blood pressure is important, cholesterol, aspirin, the ABCDs, E's. Eating and, healthy, Yeah. maintaining weight. You know, you said one thing that's important, I just want to emphasize, um, you know, it, you said it doesn't have to be that onerous. Well, you think about it. Once you get on the cholesterol meds, you and I are both on cholesterol meds. Once you get to your goal, then things really don't change that much. Mm -hmm. And same with blood pressure. So, you know, I'd say keeping your glucose in range is always a constant deal. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that onerous. And you just want to avoid problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Keep your heart pumping and your kidneys kicking. All right. Well, I think with that, oh, we're going to switch over to um, some Q&A. 
um, which I have here. So this will be honestly like a surprise to us. We're just going to read some of these as they, they've come in. Um, all right, Steve, are there medications to help if one is diagnosed with chronic, chronic kidney disease? My doctor has only said watch salt intake. Yeah, well, I'll just repeat what we said briefly, but there definitely is. First of all, the ACEs and ARBs, those are the blood pressure pills that we spoke about. Those, all, Jeremy said, those were proven 30 years ago to help protect the kidney, but only about one-tenth as much as the ones we just spoke about. The SGLT2 inhibitors, such as Farziga, and this newer medication uh, called Corindia. It's a different mechanism. You can be on both together, and I have patients on both of those who have chronic kidney disease. All right. Um, how high is high for blood pressure? So I think, you know, in general, to give specific numbers, we like people with diabetes, if possible, to get their blood pressure below 130 over 80. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would. Um, so then, you know, if you're above that, then that's a time that you, you might want to think about, you know, medications for us. Yeah, just remember, don't take one measurement. Yeah. Uh, get a cuff, measure it at different times of the day, not when you're going to the doctor's office. How much does a plant-based diet reduce your risk for heart disease? Yeah, you know what, I don't know the, I don't know the percentage, but a plant-based diet is extremely healthy diet. And those people have a better blood pressure, better cholesterol levels, and better weight. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't give you specifics, but I'm a big believer in plant-based diets. You and I got sweatshirts yeah. <laughs> from our friend in the UK, and hopefully he's watching. Ian. And I think, you know, again, it still comes down to as long as these other things are, are dealt with. Like, if your blood pressure is high and your cholesterol is high, you know, don't assume just eating plant-based is going to kind of take care of these things. If you want to go that route, absolutely. Um, but you still need to make sure these other things are, are taken care of. Totally. Um, so, um, how does high blood glucose contribute to the development of, of plaque? And I guess they're thinking like coronary arterial plaques. And... You know, that's a good question. Like, you know, I don't know. Do you want to handle that? Yeah, well, I, I'm going to answer something else first about high glucose. High glucose uh, causes damage to the micro vessels of the body. So it's a, you know, it, microvasculature. And there's microvasculature in the heart and the kidneys. And so that's one of the reasons why it also causes eye disease and nerve disease because there's microvasculature feeding blood to these organs as well. And I would say this, that um, what you said earlier in the day, it may not be so much the glucose that causes heart disease, it's, it's primarily cholesterol and blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's some things that aren't good. And I know that people that have high blood sugar for many years end up with, with high calcium scores. We don't want to get into that too much because it's not written in stone if high calcium is, is the biggest risk factor. But I would say this, that is for the heart, it's cholesterol and blood pressure mm -hmm. and being on a little blood thinner. In kidneys, we know that glucose damages the glomerulus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think there's some thinking that people with diabetes, that if they do have you know plaques in the artery, uh, that having diabetes might make those plaques a little bit more unstable and more prone to rupturing, rupturing which can increase the risk of, 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 of heart attacks. Um, but it's still, there's areas of you know uncertainty there. Yeah. Um, does the number of years if, living with type If we don't know the answer, it hasn't been studied fully yeah. yet. <laughs> Does the number of, of years living with type 1 diabetes play into starting aspirin earlier than 50? So what if you got type 1 when you were 2 and now you're 32? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say you'd have to look at your risk for heart disease. But just that fact alone probably um, does not, it probably doesn't mean that you need to take it sooner. Mm -hmm. However, you know what, if you feel being on a baby aspirin uh, uh, is healthier, you know, check with your caregiver, and I wouldn't have any problem someone 35 years old um, or older than that take aspirin. So this is along those lines. I was on an aspirin uh, and was told not to take it by my current endocrinologist. Any idea why? I'm type 1 for 18 years and over 80 years old. So um, you mentioned that it does have some issues, and, the, and the, the potential concern with aspirin, especially if you're on other blood thinners, is it can increase the risk of, of bleeding. So if you have a fall, hit your head, you know, maybe you could have a, a worse hemorrhage or, or gastrointestinal bleeding. If you have a lot of like uh, 
uh, reflux or problems with ulcers. So there are some reasons why you might not want to be on it. Yeah, you know, you have you tell your doctor to give us a buzz. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? I mean, we, we talk about this all the time that to get drugs past the FDA, they have to be studied up and down to the right, to the left. And a lot of people say that if aspirin went before the FDA now, that would never be approved. You know, because you can have, um, you can have stomach bleeding. That's why we do the baby aspirin, the enteric coated. So it's a, it's a, it's a medication that has saved lives, but like every medication does have side effects. Um, can you talk a little bit about sleep? I find that when I sleep poorly, my daily numbers go up. I'm guessing blood sugar numbers. And yeah, there's a lot of data now that about sleep, and especially with sleep apnea and people have interrupted sleep, that that can actually predispose people to, to heart disease, et cetera. That's something we actually didn't really talk about. But if you have obstructive sleep apnea, treating that can really help lower blood pressure, et cetera. <laughs> um, so in terms of blood sugars, yeah, it's possible that when you're not sleeping as much, it can affect you know hormones, your anxiety level, adrenaline, all these kinds of things. So um, sleep is definitely important in, in essentially everything. I think that's so true. Yeah. How many hours do you get? I, I don't. I, I'm lucky if I get eight, but I feel better when I do. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm like that too. Um, you said everyone over 40 who is diabetic should be on cholesterol drugs. My LDL is 67, HDL is 97. Could my cholesterol go too low on meds? So. I'm gonna take out the specifics of this question and just answer, could your, your cholesterol go too low? And the answer is really no. Um, that there's, there's no number that like, I would be concerned that somebody's LDL is lower. So, you know, the, you mentioned Joe Whitsum, who was, who's a lipidologist and used to do these talks where he would show like the LDL le levels of, of other animals in the, the animal kingdom. And lions like have an LDL of stuff? like, <laughs> yeah, giraffes are probably on there. The lions have an LDL of like eight, you know, and. And, and by the way, as we age, our LDL goes up. So when you're really young, your, your LDL levels are, are lower and they go up with age. So no, it can't go too low. Yeah, they've, it's a great question because mm -hmm. you might think you need it for other hormones, but no, the answer is no. Um, I have normal to low blood pressure, diagnosed with chronic kidney disease in March, and I was put on Losartan. I don't feel right when my systolic blood pressure is below 100 or diastolic is below this. I just changed when I take Losartan. It doesn't help. Nephrologist suggested taking Losartan. Okay, um, sounds like having problems with blood pressure going too low. Any ideas or suggestions for me? So I have one suggestion. Yeah. Ask your doctor uh, if you can get a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring device. So you can really uh, quantitate your, blood, your, your mean blood pressure during the day, at night, and then um, have a little book that they give you to put your symptoms on it. But your, your problem seems very um, specific to you. Um, and you're always welcome to email us or email uh, at our website and yeah. we can give you more specifics. I think the, the problem there is that these medications are beneficial to your kidneys, um, but your blood pressure might already be too low. And so it's trying to thread that needle to yeah. get on these medications to protect your kidneys without you know, having your blood pressure go too low. And it sounds like you're already trying some of these and I like your suggestion. So I think we'll make this our last question. Does uh, the urine, uh, albumin creatinine ratio have to be specifically ordered or can you just do the ratio? So it just has to be your urine um, microalbumin and creatinine and then yeah, you can, they can do the calculation from that. So it's not a specifically separately ordered test um, and again, it's something your provider should automatically order. And by the way, when you're looking at your results, sometimes if, it, if it's completely normal, there's no protein in the urine at all, it might say something like unable to calculate yeah, yeah. or like below the limit or you know come up as an error or something like that. That's actually a good thing. Yeah. It means that it's so low that it's, it's not calculatable. Yeah, on, on, the, on UCSD order sheet, you can put UA slash CR, mm -hmm. but Jeremy said you can calculate it out. And um, I've seen that on there several times and I, I did know what that mean, but I, at first I was confused. I mm -hmm. said, darn it, we don't have it, but that is a good sign. Make sure you get it. So I think that's it. So I think this was, this was a great talk. It was good to you go through what? all this and super important. And I think, you know, dispelling some of the um, issues around it and myths and that, you know, hopefully this empowers people to go take control. Check out our website and go to the video vault. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is our newest song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the future of diabetes is now, but of course we have six others too. All right, well, thanks for listening everybody. Take care.